You have described the death, the killing of Rayshard Brooks as tragically classic. I wonder if you could expand on what you meant by that. What I mean by that is uh, Rayshard Brooks's death uh, fits a pattern, which is to say police officers encounter, uh, in many instances, an African-American man on the street. Uh, there's an allegation of, of criminal uh, misconduct, uh, and then things quickly escalate out of control. So in this instance, you have a person who uh, is alleged to have had too much to drink, who falls asleep in a Wendy's drive through and it ends up in a police homicide. Now, where you have young black men uh, who are literally 21 times more likely to lose their lives at the hands of the police than white young men, uh, where black men, generally speaking, are three times more likely to be killed by the police than white men, this is a problem. When in American policing, literally every year, a thousand people are killed uh, at the hands of the police. And often it starts small, ends up large in traffic. The pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. And the people in the streets, the demonstrators and protesters, are attempting to disrupt that pattern and literally bring us to a point where we can re respond with, with common sense. In other words, if the U.S., can engage the North Koreans with diplomacy and, and de-escalation? Why can't we deal with one another, African Americans, with diplomacy and de-escalation on the street? This should never have happened. Cornell, you know, you said that the pattern keeps repeating itself, and I wonder if you found yourself in the situation that many others did uh, on Friday night and all day yesterday, which is, again? Did this just happen again? Aren't we dealing with, we're still trying to come to grips with countless other ones, the most recent of which right. is George Floyd. So for you, what was the initial reaction when you heard about what was going on in Atlanta? Uh, my reaction is one of uh, many, uh, like millions of people, uh, serial shock and serial trauma. Um, I'm a black man. I'm an, uh, an African-American father of two sons who fit in the same demographic, if you will, young African-American men as Rayshard Brooks. But along with so many others, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, the point being here is this has happened over and over and over again. But what it says, along with the millions of people on the streets, is that we are determined, resolved, uh, such that this never happens again. The point being here is this is intolerable. You know, in, in other words, it cannot be said that when it comes to protests and demonstrators, they're given a deadline. It's called a curfew. There's a deadline on protest. Where's the deadline on police misconduct, police brutality? Where are the goals, the metrics? In other words, when do we say we're going to reduce and eliminate police brutality in the United States? How do you propose uh, doing that, sir? Sorry, uh, please forgive me for interrupting, but how do you propose eliminating it? How do you propose putting a curfew on it? N number one. Number one, eliminating uh, chokeholds, as we're beginning to see in cities. Uh, firing. Uh, police officers who engage in this kind of conduct, establishing a national standard of excessive use of, of force, um, changing the culture of policing. So in the case of George Floyd, where you had people watch a police officer kill a black man, making those bystanders accountable. In other words, creating a culture in policing where they hold one another accountable. That's been done in New Orleans. It's been done in other cities. Uh, the point being here is we have the facts. We have the data. We have the best practices, the laws, I should say. We know what to do. We know which laws to pass. We simply have to pass them. The point being here is this is not a matter of not knowing what to do. It's a matter of failing to do what we know to do. And the demonstrators and protesters in the street, those are the ones, those are the citizens who are saying, Time's up. You know what to do. Now's the time to do it. And we're going to compel you through nonviolent resistance and peaceful protest to do it. That's what people are saying. You seeing things and move? Do, do you think it's moving in that direction? I think the fact that the mayor uh, quickly accepted resignation of the police chief in Atlanta, fired at least one of the police officers, is a sign and a symbol of a commitment to speed and a sense of urgency. But it's uh, good, but not nearly good enough, given the magnitude of the problem. The challenge here is this. 
with 18,000 police departments across 19,000 jurisdictions and 50 states in the United States, we have to move at the grassroots level, but also at the national level. In other words, it's not enough for us to have local police chiefs responding. We need mayors and governors, and yes, the president and the Congress of the United States moving quickly with a sense of urgency. Let's be clear about this. We do not have another human life, another hashtag to waste. Uh, it, the time is now, literally right now. Let me put this to you, because you know people looked at the videos, both the cell phone videos, the dash cam videos, the body cam video, and they said, here's what we know. We know that this man, Brooks, was reportedly drunk at the time, that he was sleeping in a place he wasn't meant to be sleeping, that there seemed to be some at least cordial interaction with the police initially, and then there's a scuffle. And then he allegedly takes a taser from one of the officers and allegedly tries to fire that taser at the officer. So the argument from that front is, well, the officers have to do which is, what they have to do, which is public safety. So they took out the person that they felt was potentially putting public safety at risk. How do you respond to that? Uh, straight ahead. Poor judgment on behalf of the arrestee does not excuse the absence of professional judgment by the police. If Richard Brooks took the taser and in any way threatened the police officer, poor judgment, bad judgment, that does not excuse the absence of professional judgment by the police. Experienced police officers will tell you where you have a person who's drunk and you have the car and they flee because you have the car, you know where they live. You have the registration. They already had his license. They can go to his home later and pick him up. There's no need to chase him down the street with guns drawn because the fact of the matter is not only did they shoot and kill him, but they could have shot and killed somebody else. The point being here is we don't have to have perfect black people in this society in order to accord them fair and just treatment. That's the problem here. So often we say, well, the, the arrestee, the, the black man on the street, uh, did not comport himself perfectly, was not perfectly compliant. And as a consequence, we have the justification, the rationale, and the excuse to literally shoot to kill. Again, that is not, that's a rationale. It's not an excuse. They literally could have let him run off, go to his home because they had the car and the license and pick him up later. That's what experienced police officers will tell you. Do you have any buy-in with this idea that the, the culture of policing, the system of policing that's in place in the United States needs to change? Do you have buy-in from other police departments? Have you heard from any police officers who've said, yeah, you know what, I've been in the thick of this, something's broken? Oh, absolutely. The International, the International Association of Chiefs of Police in, in this country, which is like the uh, major union, if you will, or uh, association of police chiefs management, they largely agree. It's the fraternal order of police that represent the rank and file police officers that have not uh, agreed, not stepped forward to condemn this in the way that it should be condemned. The fact of the matter is, there are police chiefs around the country, rank and file police officers around the country, who understand policing in this country cannot continue to exist if they don't enjoy the trust and respect of the public. And right now, uh, police, police departments are, are distrusted. Uh, they're not believed. Why? Because literally, we kill more people in the United States in a week than many countries kill in an entire year. A thousand people dying at the hands of the police literally every year, three men a day, all but 27 days of the year last year when someone was not killed. The point being here is, yes, the open secret in the United States and certainly in police departments is that policing is broken. And the only way to fix it is with the cooperation, the consent, the engagement of communities. And that means we've got to essentially disinvest in policing that does not work and invest in policing that does work. So police officers don't need to be mental health uh, specialists when they're not trained for that. Police officers do not need to act as warriors, uh, paramilitary on the street. When what we really need is community policing on the street. So the point being here is we've got to essentially defund what doesn't work, 
invest in the policing that does work. Natasha, this can be changed. It has been changed in certain cities. It can be changed across the country. That we know we can do. Before I let you go, you mentioned, of course, anyone who's looking at you, uh, watching this interview, you mentioned you're a black man. You also mentioned you're the father of, of young black boys and men. Um, mm -hmm. What's your fear? What's your worst case scenario for them? My worst fear for them is they will be treated as I've been treated. I'm, I'm a civil rights lawyer. I'm a fourth generation ordained minister, uh, but I look like any other black man in America. I've been pulled over at least 20, 25 times. Uh, no tickets, uh, but just profile. My fear is that one of them will be pulled over and things will move from bad to fatally worse. That is my fear. And empirically speaking, statistically speaking, based on experience, that fear is real. And one of the things I'm asking uh, of my fellow citizens in this country uh, and certainly in, in, in Canada, where there are also challenges, is that we, as fellow citizens, come together to solve this problem of bad, morally catastrophic, and fatal policing. And bring, I should say, bring policing to what it should be, which is about protecting and service with and among um, fellow citizens in our communities across the country. So I don't want my fears to come true mm -hmm. uh, for myself, for my family, or for anyone else. Okay, you know what? I actually don't want to leave it on this fear for your sons. What's your greatest <laughs> hope for your boys? My greatest hope for my, my sons is that they will uh, take their God-given gifts and abilities and contribute uh, to their fellow citizens to the best of their abilities. And that depends on two things. One, them doing all that they can do, but it also depends on our fellow citizens, all of those in our respective countries, doing all that they can do to ensure that all of our lives are protected. Black lives matter, and the life of our respective democracies matter, and that we do all that we can to safeguard them. Okay, I feel good leaving it there. Cornell Brooks, sir, thank you so okay. much for your time. Thank you. Cornell Brooks is a professor at Harvard Kennedy School and former president of the NAACP. He joined us from Manassas, Virginia.